Good morning, Brew Daily Show. I am Neil Fryman. And I'm Toby Howell. And Neil, we have a winner of our Morning Brew Mug giveaway. So just some quick backstory for anyone who wasn't aware there was a giveaway going on. We ran a contest contest over the past week where we offered to give away one of these beautiful Morning Brew Daily mugs to anyone who shared the podcast in their family group chat, their work Slack channel, anywhere they have friends gathered online. So we have a winner. Uh, we want to give a quick shout out to Dahlia Hamilton and her dad, Jeff. So Dahlia is a loyal podcast listener, but her dad, Jeff, is maybe the biggest Morning Brew fan out there. She sent us screenshot after screenshot of her dad blowing up the family group chat, promoting the brew, saying, check out this fact, this funny tidbit, check out this news quiz. So truly one of the biggest Morning Brew uh, families out there. So Jeff and Dahlia, we respect the hustle. We'll toss you an email later today, kind of getting your details so we can ship you this mug, but congrats, Jeff and Dahlia. Yes, and apparently Jeff turns, actually, I don't know. <laughs> we, 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 we don't know how old he's turning, but his birthday is on Friday, April 7th, so happy birthday. Uh, let's get into our show. It's going to be super packed. Uh, Elon Musk goes to war versus the New York Times, and all of us are dumber for it. <laughs> uh, we have a new Mystery Monday segment, so stay tuned what that is. And for the first time since 1860, people are talking about classical music. Let's go. And we'll, we'll discuss why. Uh, but first, uh, we've got a new sports entertainment juggernaut on our hands. From the top rope, UFC parent company Endeavor Group has come in to buy WWE this morning to create a new $21 billion public company that will trade under the ticker TKO. And before we were talking and I was asking, why not KO? That's way cooler. Uh, and apparently Coke has KO. <sighs> lame they ruined all the fun they ruined all the fun yeah so it's probably not a coincidence or maybe it is that this came a day after wrestlemania which is wwe super bowl in los angeles and so if all your friends were you know calling off plans this weekend it's because they were watching wrestlemania I wonder if that's where hair and makeup will be. But, yeah. <laughs> Maybe. All right. So I want to just do a quick rundown of who the players are here. So UFC is the ultimate fighting championship. It's the largest mixed martial arts organization in the world. Think Joe Rogan making all those faces from the announcing booth when people get the crap beat out of each other. That's UFC. WWE is world wrestling entertainment. Think, think WrestleMania scripted wrestling events with celebrities and people like John Cena, The Rock, Triple H. Yeah. No, it's definitely a juggernaut. It's crazy the valuations on this thing. $21 billion for the whole company, $9 billion for the, the WWE. And I do feel like this is one of those things that if you get it, you're like, oh, yeah, absolutely. And if you don't, you're like, fake wrestling, $9 billion company. I don't get it. But we saw those scenes from WrestleMania. Like, it is packed. It has this massive, massive audience. And I do just want to talk about the audience real quick because one of the things that contributes to this massive valuation is – the WWE owns social media, like absolutely mm. dominates legacy sports leagues. If we just look at YouTube channel subscribers, the, these fa these stats are from a month ago, so they're a little outdated, but it's over 92 million YouTube subscribers compared to the NBA, which has 19. The NFL only has 10 million and the MLB has 4 million. So it just absolutely wipes the floor with these legacy sports companies. Um, and then, yeah, that's that's one of the main selling points is that we reach the use. We understand social media and like we get all those eyeballs. Right. And I think they're going to be a live sports juggernaut on TV. And that's what's also commanding these big valuations. I mean, nobody watches cable anymore except for the NFL and honestly, just the NFL. Yeah. So uh, UFC and WWE can come in and say, look, we have property that we have events and property that you as entertainment, uh, you know, Broadcast. companies broadcasters want and so they can command huge s sports rights deals i mean the nba and these are blowing up anyway the nfl just agreed to 2.5 billion dollars for their sunday ticket package yeah. uh, with youtube tv and that was a billion dollars more than the previous contract rights and i think both wwe and ufc their contracts are expiring soon so they're going to go back to the table and, and just be yeah. in a, an amazing leverage position and an interesting fact about the television deals too is the WWE and the UFC have no off season. So they actually command these higher valuations because there is no off season. Whereas the NFL, it's only 18 games now per, per season. 
WWE is nonstop. It goes all year long. So it's not attracting as many eyeballs on like a per match or per game basis. But since it has a whole year to play with, it gets it gets there in the end. Can we talk about the people involved in this deal? Because the personalities are larger than life. You have Endeavor CEO Ari Emanuel. So for people who don't know, he's the Hollywood power broker who was in the inspiration for Ari Gold in Entourage. Then you have Dana White, who's this larger than life character, president of UFC. <laughs> and then I haven't even mentioned Vince McMahon, WWE's executive chairman, who bought it from his dad for $1 million in 1982 and then sold it uh, yesterday, today for $9.3 billion. So he it, comes out of this looking pretty good. And two of them are from Ma Massachusetts. Actually, no, uh, Dana White's from Massachusetts and as is uh, Joe Rogan from Massachusetts. So there's some there's some mass blood going through there. A lot of mass blood. Neil's from Mass, so that's why I, yeah. I bring it up. That is a crazy story. Uh, again, we, we got to dive into the world of WWE uh, yesterday and this morning, so that was pretty fun for us. I'm not watching it again, though. I watched WrestleMania for an hour, and I was just like, this is reality TV. I'm intrigued. I like, yeah. you. I it. saw a guy get kicked in the <laughs> face by a 300-pound linebacker, essentially, with no muscle, you know, with no fat, and he just takes it in the face 15 times, and if any of those actually connected, he would be in the hospital. Neil, suspend the leap. Dis I just believe for it. a second. I don't That's get funny. it. Sorry. Okay. Oh, yuck. Anybody's yum. We're going to uh, switch gears here for uh, a second. And our second story today is about a Wall Street Journal reporter, Evan Gershkovich, was arrested last week by Russian authorities and charged with espionage. So over the weekend, tension has kind of continued to rise in this saga. In a pretty rare phone call, actually, between the U.S. and Russia, the U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, told his Russian counterpart that Gershkovich's detention was unacceptable and demanded Russia release him and another detained American, Paul Whelan. So, Neil, if this story sounds familiar, it's because it, it is. Like, we kind of went through this whole thing with Brittany Griner and her detainment in Russia. We're entering this new era of hostage diplomacy, as the Wall Street Journal called it, which is actually what Gershkovich was in Russia reporting on. But before we get into this idea of hostage diplomacy, we should talk about who Evan is, like who he is as a person. Yeah. So most news stories I try to keep emotional distance from, but this one kind of hit home. I don't want to say it could have been me scenario because this guy is way braver, doing way cooler stuff. Like tra he uprooted his life here in the United States to go to Russia in 2017. And now he's literally reporting from a war zone. So and I'm just here as a podcaster. So I want to make that clear. But he is both. We're both 31 from the like Jewish families from the Northeast work in the same industry. So I felt like a little kinship with him. Um, but yeah, he drew, grew up in New Jersey to, to Russian immigrants and developed a lifelong fascination with Russia and Russian culture. And and then kind of just left, went, went to Bowdoin College um, and then picked up his bags and, and worked in various outlets starting in 2017 uh, in Russia. And eventually, I think right before the war, he, he started working for the Wall Street Journal. Now he's in jail forever yeah no it's definitely a crazy and again we've mentioned hostage diplomacy but it is this thing now where u.s citizens are increasingly being like held captive or held in uh, uh wrongfully detained in countries as a means of like getting like extorting the u.s basically yeah. and so 54 u.s citizens deemed to be held hostage or wrongfully detained there there are currently 54 in 15 countries such as cuba Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and of course, Russia, because it is this bargaining chip that you can kind of hold over the U.S. in order to get something you want out of them. And what do they want? Russia is probably a prisoner swap. That's what they they traded Victor Bout, who was known as the merchant of death for Brittany Griner last December. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is what people are expecting for Evan here. Uh, and I, something that was interesting was that Bill Richardson, who's the former New Mexico governor, and now he's kind of an expert. He's moved into expert in getting Americans homed. He said that what we have to do to try to get Evan home is not is not is do what we did with Brittany Griner, which was, you know, raise awareness and go through media and, and mount this large media campaign. And uh, that will sort of like bring, you know, that will accelerate negotiations. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is that this phone call that you were talking about, Previously, that would have taken months to arrange, and then here it was four days after Evan uh, was detained uh, over there. Yeah. So um, we'll see what happens, but I think raising awareness around it seems like a, uh, a really important thing. 
And final note, since we're both soccer fans, Evan is a big soccer player. And my favorite fact is that he came in at, at Bowdoin in an NCAA tournament game. He did not play 110 minutes. And then in the penalty kicks, he came in and slotted the game winner. <laughs> so I don't know. You're, you're better at soccer than me. You can, tell, you can tell me what it's like to not play the entire game it's and then come in at the end. So tough. I hate when managers like sub in a player who hadn't played at right. all. And, but, hey, Evan, Evan stepped and up. And Estelle was pretty good. Yeah. Uh, it, let's move on. Um, this is a dumb story, but it is kind of important. Uh, it was another chaotic weekend. Another chaotic weekend over on the Bird app. Elon Musk began removing blue check marks from accounts that don't pay for Twitter blue, except he didn't, except he kind of did. <laughs> the, re- the really quick background here is that to bring in more revenue, Musk has been, uh, you know, asking people to uh, pay for subscription blue, uh, uh, Twitter blue, which is a subscription, or else they'll lose their check mark Saturday, April 1st. That sparked an outcry from celebrities who were like, like LeBron James, who, who was saying, I'm not paying you. And there were concerns that impersonators could swarm. The point of the check mark in the first place was to verify the identities of famous people. Anyway, the deadline came and went. And for the most part, blue check marks were not removed because it was a manual process, the Washington reported. reported and it's like a spreadsheet. <laughs> it's truly. Did you read that? Yeah, I, I actually did see that. People are so confused. First of all, if you're going to set a date for anything do not set it on april 1st because no one takes it (laughs) seriously and then yeah everyone's check mark is still there except except you're right except except the new york times and this is the very petty thing musk does not like the times for their critical coverage of him and tech and after learning that the times wouldn't pay for a twitter subscription musk said that he would read remove its badge so the new york times has had its badge removed and then musk went on to hurl insults at them yeah you i mean you buried the lead a little bit too in the sense that you said he found out that they won't pay for it. He found out by replying to a Twitter account called Doge Designer, <laughs> okay, yeah. who tweeted at midnight on Sunday a meme basically saying like, oh, New York Times like won't pay for it. And it was like right. Elon Musk saying, I don't care. And then Elon, of course, responds to that two minutes later and says, oh, interesting. Like maybe we'll just take it away. And that's the one he took away. Uh, obviously, it's a little bit of a joke. Like, I mean, I mean not a joke in the sense that but it's like petty that he's reacting to this meme and and whatnot. But it is really dangerous to remove the check mark from New York Times, especially if in the age of misinformation, when you're trying, he's specifically trying to fight bad actors, but it seems like every step he does enables them. Like, let's take the news, the newspaper of, uh, what's it called? What is the time? News, uh, the Gray Lady. News, <laughs> it's n- nicknamed the Gray Lady, and then maybe the newspaper of record. But I yeah, don't know. of record, the newspaper <laughs> of record. Let's take away their check mark, and and as a, a petty feud, yeah. <sighs> he just messed this whole thing up because he's turned a check mark into an anti-status symbol. Yeah, the influencers, the people who are famous, don't want it, and a lot of people who have large followings don't want it because it makes it seem like they pay Elon Musk, right? And no one wants to be seen like it, with it, like that. It's become this very interesting yeah status switch um before we we jump to break uh one of the things that twitter has said uh, with the little guidance it's given is that the top twitter's top 500 advertisers and its 10,000 most followed organizations who were previously verified wouldn't have to pay for verification except the new york times except for the new york times so i checked and the morning brew is the 26,200th most followed account on twitter okay. so we're close like we we got to make up 16,000 and then morning brew could keep its check marks so, right, let's go so if social media team if but we don't pay for it that's important we don't pay for it but if we get into that top 10,000 then we won't have to all right we've got a new Monday segment that asked the question, who won the weekend? All right, Toby and I will, will each nominate a contender, and I'll go first because I'm introing it. <laughs> and, you, so, and you came up with the segment. And so. I came up with the segment. We'll yeah. see if it's good or not. Give us your feedback. <laughs> uh, all right, so train derailments aren't really a laughing matter, but one derailed in Montana this weekend and spilled an entire car of Coors Light and Blue Moon into an area near a river. And a photographer captured this fisherman who's on his boat. He rode up to the hundreds of cases of beer that had piled up. And this guy has a bottle of Coors Light in his hand with the biggest smile I've ever seen, truly looking like the happiest person in the world. So he won the weekend because he found, you know, 
hundreds of cases of free beer, and he's just a really happy dude, and I'm so happy for him. This is it is pure joy. Pure like, joy. You know he heard about it. He's he got his little rowboat out. I love the fact that it's a rowboat. Yeah, it's probably like 40 degrees crisp in Montana. Also over there, it's gorgeous where this train yeah. derailed. Yeah. But it is also just zooming out to some some more new stuff. It's kind of weird how. We hear about train derailments all the time now. They probably happened every day for the past 150 years, and we just didn't realize it, and now they're being reported on after the East Palestine one. Yeah, no, it is. that is like an interesting uh, ripple of the last news cycle. But it, I don't think we would have gotten that photo without it, so in a way, yeah, it's interesting, yeah. Okay, Neil, that was a great winner. My winner of the weekend was actually a couple of April Fool's jokes. So honestly, April Fool's happened this weekend. It's usually the worst. Like there's no good ones. But this year, I think there was two brands that actually killed it. The first one is actually uh, Duolingo. So Duolingo, who already has this unhinged presence on TikTok and social media, released this high quality tra trailer for a reality TV show they call Love Language. And we'll actually play you a little clip of that trailer right now. Coming soon, the hottest singles in the world will share a house in paradise in hopes of finding true love. The catch? None of them speak the same language. Niemand sagt mir was. Introducing Love Language from Duolingo and Peacock. Do we have a parental guidance feature on our YouTube. I, that was a little spicy for 9 a.m. That's kind of the, the joke. Like, it's <laughs> playing off Love Island, right. playing off all these reality TV shows. Honestly, no one fell for the April Fool's joke. They knew that they weren't making it, but everyone just respected how hardcore they went. Like, it is so well produced. And the worst part is, it could be true. Like, that's yeah. the root of every good April Fool's joke. It's like, yeah, I could see it. Right. So that was our first one. And then the second one, real quick, comes from an unlikely source, Chester com so they posted a open application for its CEO position and some of the requirements kind of made Twitter laugh and I quote applicants must be rated at least 1600 in online chess have 10 plus years of management experience in tech or gaming and not have an MBA from Harvard mm. so it just made people giggle a little bit and honestly this one did fool I was duped where people were like they forgot it was April Fools again. They saw these requirements like, wow, chess.com is hilarious. So that was those were two uh, different approaches to April Fools that I both think landed pretty well. Yeah, I like the one on chess.com that asked, what was your first memory of chess? In parentheses, required. Yeah. I, I was thinking, yeah, that seems like a reasonable thing I for know. a chess.com CEO to have. It's funny, yeah. So that was sort of our winners from the weekend. Great segment. Or maybe not. We'll see what the, the <laughs> listeners think. Um, okay, but we're going to jump into our next story. So now this next story I know is very new and do your heart, Neil. So I'll quickly intro it and then kind of turn it over to you. So just Pressure. before the weekend last week, Apple Music released its classical music app to the world. Now, this doesn't seem like big news, but classical music aficionados like yourself have been kind of going nuts over it. And Neil, I know that you were telling me about the, the problem and the struggle of listening to classical music on streaming apps. So take us through yeah. why this was a big deal. You set me up here big time, a lot of pressure. But this is a big deal because searching for classical music on Apple Music or Spotify was kind of like using Bing pre chat GPT integration. Streaming services are designed for pop songs, which only have a very limited amount data points, right? You have the song, the artist, and the album. That's it. Classical music has so much more metadata. It has the conductor, the work, the composer, the ensemble, the movement, the soloist, instrument, and then there's also a nickname. So searching for and surfacing something that's actually good and something you want to listen to is kind of a nightmare. So I want to give you a little little example. Okay. Do you know this song? You know? Yeah, there you go. Okay, so that's called Rondo a la Turca, okay? okay. A Turkish March. It's by Mozart. Except that, what I just said, is such the tip of the iceberg if you want to get a good recording of this. So... That piece is actually part of Mozart's Piano Sonata Number no. 11 in A major, K33, K331. And Rondo alla Turca is just the third movement of that, and that's formally called the Allegretto. 
Okay, so take all of that. That's that's all of the data stringing together its name, and then you have thousands of actual performances that do that same that play that same piece of music, and only you know maybe thirty or forty of them you want to listen to, and the rest is trash. It's like searching for Taylor Swift song and getting a bunch of random you know people covering in their bedroom. Yeah. So that's what it's like searching for for classical music and Apple Music. What's this app called? <laughs> Apple Music Classic. Apple Music Classic is, uh, you know, making this a lot easier by giving us better uh, metadata and allowing classical music enthusiasts to search and surface things that are actually good and important. See, this is why I turned it over to you, because that example I would not have been able to produce. But yeah, it is truly setting the classical music world on fire because it's clear Apple put a lot of time and effort yeah. into this because you're right. It was such a difficult problem to solve. Like this metadata is crazy. If you if you start thinking about it, of course you couldn't find good stuff on Spotify. So yeah, it is interesting to see that Apple like devoted so much time and resources to it. So it will be interesting to see if they see a meaningful bump in like subscriptions to yeah. Apple Music and if this is going to be a game changer in the long term for them. <sighs> Let's move on to what to watch for the week ahead. And there is so much this like this week is absolutely packed. I mean, tomorrow's going to be a zoo down in lower Manhattan because President Trump is coming to be arraigned um, for his indictment. And we'll actually learn the charges filed against him over. It's expected to be over these these hush money payments. Mm -hmm. We'll get the mugshot. We'll get the fingerprints. But we're not going to get like the handcuffed perp no. walk um, because he is reportedly going to voluntarily give himself up for arraignment. Right. So if he had it, he would be in handcuffs. So still going to be a crazy it's day. It's going to be, it's going to be a circus down there. Uh, tonight is the national championship game for the men's basketball tournament, UConn versus San Diego state. We called UConn. Uh, no one saw San Diego state. We called, you called, UConn. I called UConn. You called UConn. But last night we have to talk about the women's basketball oh game, which was everyone was talking about. I'm still so mad at the refs. I cannot believe they gave Caitlin Clark a technical for just the, the softest technical I've ever seen. Good game to LSU, but like I was really mad at the refs. This might have been women's college basketball coming out party, as we talked about. I mean, it, it was all over yep. social media. Everyone was talking about it, and this sport is growing. So exciting. I loved watching it. Um, oil prices will be in focus. They're actually jumping up 8% this morning after OPEC Plus, a group of oil-producing countries led by Saudi Arabia, announced a production cut. That sent prices spiking this morning, and that is not good for inflation or gas prices over here. Can't so catch, can't catch a break. Man. Can't catch a break. As two, as two guys who don't own cars, we can't <laughs> can't catch a break. Yeah, I just like following it, and yeah. you know, people love to complain about it. So uh, I'm sure we'll hear about it if gas prices do go up. That won't be for you know a couple weeks down the down the road. Um, spring holidays. So we got Passover on Wednesday, Easter on Sunday, and then Good Fridays on Friday, and the stock market will be closed then. It's always the wildest that Good Friday closes the market down. You always forget about it. Is it a federal holiday? I guess so. It's a bank holiday. It's a bank it's holiday. A bank holiday. Yeah. That's really weird. Um, yeah, I'm hosting my first Seder, so I've got to go. I'm going to leave like right now and go start, start cooking. cooking some matzo ball soup. No. Um, what else we got? McDonald's is ter temporarily closing its offices this week ahead of expected layoffs in its corporate division. Today, later today, NASA will reveal the four astronauts heading to the moon, around the moon, on the Artemis II mission, which is slated for... Uh, November 2024. Let's. Maybe I'm, I'm, I would love to go. I'm excited about that too because we, we we know the study that more kids want to be YouTubers now than astronauts. So maybe this might turn the tide back if they start going to the moon again. And then uh, a tournament near and dear to our hearts. Masters tees off on Thursday. Tiger Woods is playing. As I just hope he makes the cut. And then the March job reports will be released on Friday. Happy that could have just been our entire show. Right there. Um, we're also hosting the final four for our best greatest logo of all time. So head to our socials at MB Daily show show at on Instagram and Twitter. Yeah, we have a final four. Final four. Let's vote on that. Uh, and or you could just email us uh, at morningbrewdaily at morningbrew.com. As always, a big mazel tov to our control room in the back and all the amazing people who work there. Show's producer and editor is Emily Milliron. The show's technical director is Justin Orlando. Our supervising producer is Bryce Beloff. Kelsey Jones is our kick butt audio engineer. Hair and makeup is down by the courthouse, staking out a good spot for Trump's arraignment for us. Hair and makeup, so so thoughtful. Devin Emery is our chief content officer, and our show is a production of Morning Brew. Great show today, Neil. Let's run it back tomorrow.